right. Well, good morning. It is good to be here, and uh, I've been gone for two weeks. I hope you noticed. Uh, but uh, if you didn't, then uh, that's okay. I won't take offense at that. Uh, it is good to be back home. Uh, I'm always uh, I'm always glad to be back home. It makes me appreciate uh, the life here in the Northwest when I go other places. Primarily, my trips wind up taking me south of the Mason-Dixon line, and so I had lots of heat and humidity. And for those of you that are not appreciating this overcast sky and 60s while you're sitting out here, your heat wave did not last long enough for that to, you know, to make you appreciative of this. Uh, that humidity and heat uh, down south as I was traveling uh, was enough to make me look forward to July 4th in the Northwest, which this is pretty classic weather for. But uh, it is good to be back, and uh, I appreciate those who uh, filled in in uh, my absence. Uh, Cameron, as he uh, ministered the word to you the last two weeks, uh, it's nice to uh, be able to uh, travel and know that uh, I've left things in good hands, and also uh, the other pastors here at Sunbreak, uh, Mark and uh, or Mark. Uh, it's a habit. I was gonna, I was gonna get to you. I was gonna say Mark and Brad and Kevin, but uh, uh, Mark is uh, down in Georgia somewhere doing things, and uh, uh, so. But uh, it is good. Uh, Kevin and Brad uh, always handle things uh, very well while I'm gone, and. I came back and uh, they had all the logistics and uh, so many of you have pitched in to uh, make things happen uh, this morning here. Uh, this is uh, this is like really exciting to me. This is my excited face in case you were wondering. Uh, Brenda tells me, yes, it's uh, kind of the same all of the time, but uh, I, I'm very excited. Uh, going down south for two weeks, it's the contrast is, is quite stark. Uh, I left. And I'll have to admit that for probably about the first four or five days I was there, I felt like I was doing something wrong uh, because there's not any semblance of social distancing or mask wearing or anything. It's like COVID never existed down there. And that's just not what we were accustomed to here in the Northwest. And uh, so, you know, it, it was a very uh, interesting thing to me uh, as I contemplate that. Uh, I think that it made me uh, really appreciate, uh, really in a sense, uh, the, the, well, coming back and then, you know, really the release uh, where masks are now an option for us uh, and, uh, you know, not, not a requirement for us. I, I, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I, I realized after two weeks of not wearing a mask, going back to the airport, uh, I realized how restrictive that felt. And uh, so I'm glad that things have loosened up a bit. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I have no regrets for the caution uh, that we approach things with, uh, you know, as far as, uh, especially here at our church, uh, but I am glad not to have to labor underneath those restrictions, and I pray that God preserves our health and uh, uh, our, uh, our health and our well-being. Um, you know, I was thinking about that even with regard to July 4th, and it's kind of fortuitous that July 4th winds up falling on Sunday, it's a good excuse for a barbecue outside, of course. And uh, you know, I, I think about uh, I think about the things that we have to be grateful for uh, as a country. And uh, I uh, served in the military, and I consider myself uh, patriotic. And uh, I love our country. I'm grateful for the things that uh, it has afforded us. And uh, I know that for me, uh, as I contemplate some of the things that it has provided. Uh, let's see, where am I at? I'll orient here. Uh, Independence Day is, uh, it, it's a special day. It's a, a day that uh, has been set aside by our country uh, to celebrate the signing of the uh, Declaration of Independence in 1776. Uh, and actually, uh, it was the approval of it, for those of you who are history buffs, uh, I know that you'll probably correct me afterwards. It wasn't signed until, a, a, well, actually August the 2nd, uh, but we don't celebrate August the 2nd. Uh, because the approval of it was on July the 4th, Independence. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing to me as I contemplate that. There are some other words that are almost synonymous with the word uh, independence. Uh, and uh, you, you're familiar with them. And especially as Americans, we have a great affinity for them, a great love and a concern about them. Uh, what are some of the words that kind of wind up being synonymous? You guys help me out. Is that the wind? 
So, all right, it'll be better if I turn this way. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we talked about that before the service, yeah. But anyway, we can put up with this for a little while. Uh, what are some of the other words that go along with independence? What, what comes to y'all's mind? Freedom. Freedom. That's a that's a big one, isn't it? Freedom. And then there's another one. Starts with an L. Liberty. Okay, so liberty, independence, freedom. Uh, those are words that uh, really wind up rising in significance in our hearts and in our minds as a country uh, this time of the year. And uh, I think uh, I think it is just that. Uh, or it is correct, I think, that we celebrate them. And uh, I'm very grateful for the liberty that's provided. You know, I was contemplating this and thinking about, uh, well, let's see, you guys may have to advance the side. Oh, did, did you advance it or did I? Okay, well, things are not gonna work probably exactly right. Let's try it backwards. It didn't go backwards either, did it? Okay. All right, well, I'm just gonna ignore you guys in that screen and I'll, I'll struggle along with what we've got here. But uh, I was thinking about this, uh, you know, our, our uh, Declaration of Independence, and uh, actually this is uh, the second paragraph, not the preamble, but it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed with their, or by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And those are words, of course, that uh, as uh, Americans, you know, we're very familiar with those words. And uh, it has uh, that word in it that I talked to you about being, well, you mentioned to me that was synonymous with this idea of independence, which uh, is liberty. And I want to spend a few moments talking to you about the concept of liberty, and especially as how it relates to the Bible, uh, because uh, as, as much of a, uh, as much of a uh, American as I may be, uh, I have to say that before I pledge my allegiance to America, I have given my heart and my life and pledged my allegiance to a Savior. And I know that if you're here this morning, that you'd have to agree with that, that uh, my first allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ for who He is and what He has done with me. Now that doesn't uh, cause the gratitude that I have, uh, the privileges that uh, I enjoy because of being a citizen of the United States. It doesn't it doesn't dim the gratitude that uh, I feel in my heart about that. But what it does do is it tempers it uh, with an understanding of, of something more. And I want to share that with you because as the land that we live in, I think probably marches down the path towards uh, more and more secularism. You will see that uh, even the words that we behold in our Declaration of Independence, uh, which have a, a ring of... Uh, of a Judeo-Christian ethic in them, reference to a creator. Uh, you know, when we, when we see those things that we march further and further away from that, and I think it becomes more important uh, as uh, we progress, uh, you know, towards uh, a secularism that doesn't reflect necessarily biblical values, that we ground our heart and our understanding uh, of even the words that are used uh, and see them in light of what God's word says. And like I told you, as grateful as I am for the liberty that this nation and being a citizen of it affords me, I recognize some things about that very liberty that are important in reaching a place of proper understanding, understanding that's tempered by what God's Word says. So I want to share a few thoughts with you this morning uh, about the concept of liberty and understanding that uh, liberty as we understand it, uh, most of the time uh, we do so in the context of, uh, well, uh, of, a, of a secular approach. And we see liberty really as a lack of restraints. But as we look at the scripture, I think that it's important that we understand that uh, there is a lie inherent in the concept of liberty as defined in the secular world. Uh, it's a lie which uh, lies not by commission in a sense, but by omission. It leaves out uh, something very important, and we'll talk more about it this morning. Uh, I have several quotes this morning that I want to share with you is because there's an abundance of material out there on uh, independence and liberty and freedom in this, in this particular time. But I was intrigued by this one, which wasn't even by uh, a man of American heritage, uh, Sir John Pickstone Ben, and he said this, kind of tongue-in-cheek. He said, liberty is being free from the things that we don't like in order to be slaves of the things that we do like. And uh, I think uh, that that kind of winds up 
uh, as a defining moment for me as I began to contemplate what liberty actually looks like outside of uh, a biblical understanding and grounding of uh, its origin. And, you know, this saying as it, as it speaks really, uh, it, it contemplates the idea that all of us are uh, really enjoying only uh, a pale, uh, well, a pale version of what liberty is outside of God. We'll talk more about that as we go into it. I think it's interesting that Jesus really affirmed this concept uh, as he spoke to the Pharisees when he told them, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. And uh, we know that slavery is a blight upon our nation's history. But what Jesus affirms for us in the New Testament, as he spoke to these men, was that uh, even though they thought they were children of Abraham and had never fallen underneath bondage, which wasn't actually true anyway, uh, but even as he spoke to them, he acknowledged before them and informed them of the fact that if we have sin in our life, and I think that all of us, uh, you know, for the most part, are pretty comfortable admitting that we're sinners, right? I mean, uh, that's not something that we have to really backpedal on and say, I'm not sure. Uh, we, we're pretty freely ad admitting that we're sinners. And it's kind of an old preacher joke, but uh, I don't mind telling someone I'm a sinner. But if they ask me, well, what did you do today? Then I get a little bit more reluctant, you know, maybe about sharing. But what Jesus said there was that uh, because we are born into sin in this world, in a depraved condition, uh, because of our forefather Adam, we really bring sin to the table as a part of our operating system. Jesus affirmed that we literally are slaves to the sin that is a part of our makeup uh, that we're born with. And so as we talk about liberty, even, uh, even in the context of this day of Independence Day, we really only celebrate in a secular sense a form of liberty. Uh, we still remain as a people enslaved to the sin when we are without God. And so there, there is sort of a lie in liberty for those who don't acknowledge God and don't understand what the Bible speaks about this, that they really feel that they are free, that they have liberty, uh, that their life is before them and all of the choices that, uh, that they would desire uh, are available. And uh, it is protected, it is coveted, it is guaranteed, it is declared. Uh, but it's not, it's not actually real in some senses. Uh, so this lie of liberty, I think, is expounded upon in Scripture, that literally, without God, we are a slave to sin. You know, I was a pastor and lawyer, actually a Harvard-educated lawyer, back in the 1700s, uh, named Nathaniel Niles. And he said, it's a very strange man who sits in a prison cell and boasts about the fact that he is free from having responsibility of having to go out and work. And it's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting statement uh, of sorts that we would assert because we have liberty in one area that we don't remain enslaved in others. And that really is the condition of those who stand without God in their lives. Even as we celebrate the liberty that has been paid for, that has been bought and purchased by the blood of many sacrificing over the years in our country, we recognize that in one sense we still are sitting in a cell without Christ. You know, Jesus said a little, a little bit later on in the conversation with the Pharisees as he talked to them about being slave to sin, he said, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. He wanted them to understand what real freedom actually looked like. And uh, they were experiencing, you know, all honesty, only uh, just uh, a dim reflection of it in their life without the Son. This same pastor that I mentioned before, Nathaniel Niles, said this. He said, by neglecting to embrace the gospel, we convert civil liberty, which is in itself a delicious kind of food, into a slow poison. And in all honesty, I think that there is, in a sense, a way that we are lured because of the liberty that we enjoy in this nation, that we can prosper without the hand of God in our life. That somehow things are okay without acknowledging God. And that is the lie that is inherent in liberty. I'm grateful for the liberty that this nation and citizenship in it affords us. Uh, I will go to my grave grateful to God for that privilege. But I also understand that uh, it has inherent within it, as I said, an untruth. You know, 
there's also something, not just a lie that is contained within liberty without God, but there's also a limit to liberty, the limit of liberty. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit more about that. There's a, a famous quote, which if you are uh, an amateur historian here this morning, uh, well, probably most of you are familiar with it. You might remember Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said this uh, about the liberty that we hold dear, uh, a liberty that is enjoyed by us, that of free speech. He said the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Uh, this was an interesting ruling that was handled, uh, handed down on an occasion, and this was back in the early 1900s, I think it was right around 1919, uh, that uh, this ruling was handed out by the Supreme Court. And incidentally, it was actually overturned in 1969, and it's quoted many times out of context, but I think it expresses a sentiment uh, that, that probably all of us inherently understand, uh, that liberty in and of itself uh, winds up being a commodity that has uh, its limits. You know, as we examine scripture, we find out that this thought is consistent with what uh, God's word says. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, the apostle Paul wrote, and if you've ever uh, really done any reading uh, outside of scripture about the book of Galatians, you will know that uh, throughout history, uh, especially those who were oriented toward the Bible and towards Christianity, the book of Galatians was used to champion uh, freedom and liberty. Uh, it was uh, almost kind of a manifesto for those who had aligned themselves uh, with biblical Christianity. Uh, Martin Luther King was uh, one who quoted extensively from there. And, uh, you know, as we read this passage, the Apostle Paul said this, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And you know, the, the limit for liberty for uh, you as a, a Christian, a person who has aligned themselves with biblical values, a person who has accepted the payment that Jesus made on the cross, when you align yourself with liberty, I think there needs to be a recognition that our liberty winds up having limits. And uh, that limit is a limit that is expressed in this. And it says this, it says, do not use liberty as uh, an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And it says that liberty needs to be tempered by a love for others. Uh, it needs to be not driven only by the desire for me to have things the way that I want it. And I think it's been an interesting thing for me to observe and to watch from a pastoral perspective over the past year and a half to see that played out uh, in uh, people's lives. And uh, it, it's just been, it's been, been an interesting study. In some instances, it's been disappointing for me. In others, it has affirmed the fact that God is alive and well in the hearts of his people. But as, G, as the Apostle Paul wrote in this passage of scripture, he, he asserted that our liberty, even in Christ, as we experience it, needs to be tempered by the fact that a consideration for others is a part of what God has called us to. You know, literally, liberty without limits winds up being not liberty, uh, but anarchy. Uh, my dad, I remember when I was growing up, uh, I don't remember a lot of his sermons when I was young, to tell the truth. I either slept through them or drew on paper or, you know, something like that when I was a kid. But whenever he used an illustration, I kind of perked up a little bit. And I always remember it. I remember a particular illustration that he used uh, that, has, uh, that has probably some relevance here. Uh, and he talked about uh, uh, an, Irish, uh, an Irishman, an immigrant from Ireland, and he arrived in Boston. Uh, on the ship, and uh, he immediately was just uh, overjoyed at the fact that finally he was to a land that guaranteed, that uh, that really uh, pushed forward the concept of liberty. And as he was walking down the streets, he was looking for a policeman, and the first one that he spotted, he walked up to him and he hit him as hard as he could, right in the nose. And the next thing he knew, he was waking up in a jail cell with a big knot on his head. And he was confused because he said, I thought this place was a place where we had liberty. And the policeman that was attending told him, he said, your liberty stops where 
our nose begins. And you know, I, I remember I remember that story, and I think probably it speaks to the idea uh, of a limit on liberty. And I think we understand this intuitively, uh, but yet we chafe. And even during this time that has been very difficult, and I know a uh, grievous time for many uh, through COVID, we have struggled with, uh, you know, with the autonomy uh, and the individual rights and, and the good of the many and to, and to try to find balance between those. And that's not just a philosophical thing that has been spoken about and written about since the time of the Greek philosophers and probably even before that. Uh, it's actually something that winds up being worked out in our daily life and in the culture even that we live in. But we understand that liberty has to be tempered. Uh, and you know, I, I think about it, I think about who Jesus Christ is and about His laying aside of His individual rights so that I might have my sin paid for and forgiven. So that you might have the opportunity to have eternal life, that we might enjoy that. And I recognize that uh, there was a tension even between, uh, you know, what was good for the many and, and the individual rights that he had, that he laid aside the throne that he had. And so as we contemplate this idea of limits and liberty, I think it's important that we adopt a biblical perspective. You know, a passage of scripture, I think, that speaks to this, it says this, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all and therefore all have died. And not to deal with the immediate context of this, but, but really just to kind of pause for a moment and examine that first part of the statement, that the love of Christ controls us, that what he demonstrated, his ethic, if you will, uh, the display of his character uh, showed us what limiting yourself is. It shows us what a God who is sovereign, who had the choice of anything he desired and anything he wanted, limited himself and instead gave his life for us on the cross. Uh, the limit of liberty is a very real thing, and we have benefited from it in spite of the fact that we enjoy it so much, we recognize that necessity. And this is the last thing that I want to share with you is that of the Lord of Liberty. So we have a lie that's inherent within liberty without God. We have a limit that is displayed by God, but really we have a Lord who is the Lord of Liberty. And you know, I ran across a quote from a guy who just recently died. I say recently, probably in the last 13 or 14 years, I think 2006. He's a renowned pastor, William Sloan Coffin. And he said this, he says, there are three kinds of patriots two bad and one good. And he says the bad are the uncritical lovers and the loveless critics. The good patriots carry on a lover's quarrel with their country. And uh, I'll let that sink in for just a second for you. Um, what he said was is that a, a patriot uh, who is an uncritical lover uh, is not willing to face the shortcomings uh, of what they love. And then there's also the loveless critic. Uh, it's the one who displays no love, uh, but only finds the shortcomings. Neither of those really wind up, I think, benefiting or displaying the kind of patriotism, uh, which I believe is, is merited uh, in the place that we live. But he's finished off with this. He said, good patriots carry on a lover's quarrel with their country. And, and I like that phraseology. I like what he said. Good patriots carry on a lover's quarrel with their country. Uh, I see the shortcomings. Uh, I recognize that, you know, the Declaration and, and of Independence and the Constitution as originally written actually, for instance, failed to grant, how you doing? <laughs> uh, they failed to grant women the right to vote. You girls are probably not up for that, right? Uh, I'm sorry, you ladies. Uh, uh, it, it, it failed to guarantee women the, the right to vote uh, as originally written. And so women's suffrage wound up being a part of some changes that came. Uh, it also uh, failed uh, to end the blight of, of slavery, uh, of one person owning another person in this country. And uh, our country suffered uh, probably one of the most brutal wars, uh, a war within our borders in order to see the abolishment of that. And uh, so, you know, we can look back and have a very distinct love for our country and the pain 
uh, that uh, has has come about because of things that needed to change because of shortcomings that were there. Still expressing, still expressing an ardent love. I like it. A lover's quarrel. 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 I was down south for two weeks, <laughs> so you'll have to excuse my pronunciation. I'm reverting back to my southern roots here. Uh, a lover's quarrel. Um, I think about that, and I think about how we have to kind of approach it that way. Um, it, it's sort of that way with uh, with everybody we love, isn't it? Or everything we love. We kind of have to love in spite of the shortcomings, and uh, that's that's what grace is. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that with the Lord of Liberty, with who Jesus Christ is, the God that we serve, that it's it's not like that. We don't have to look at God and say, uh, you know, that in that lover's quarrel mode, say, well, you know, I mean, heaven is so good that I can ignore this shortcoming in God, this failure. Uh, the Lord of Liberty is absolute. Uh, in his perfection and see this is this is the difference between a liberty that is undergirded by the God we serve and the biblical values that uh, he has revealed for us a liberty that's uh, lived out uh, underneath the Lord uh, who is literally the Lord of Liberty you know in James chapter 1 there's a phrase that I love there describing uh, the Word of God he says in the book of James chapter 1 but he who looks into the what the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this one will be blessed in what he does and you know so God has set out in front of us he's given us as as a great gift through his spirit the inspiration of his spirit uh, the pen of man moving as Scripture says, Theonustos, as God breathed for the Word, He's given us the perfect law of liberty. One that's not tempered by a love that has to accept imperfect. A love who is, has to accept less than the best. Uh, it is a liberty that truly resides in the Lord of liberty. I'm thankful for this. I also understand that no matter how grateful I am that I, that I live in this nation, for my citizenship, the privileges that it gives me, uh, I understand that it truly is, as Scripture says, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And even as Jesus spoke, when the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You're truly free. That where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's real liberty. There's a liberty that transcends the privilege that we enjoy as a part of uh, being a part of this nation, uh, a privilege that uh, transcends what we can see here, what's uh, imperfect, even though loved. And uh, I'm thankful for this God that we serve, a uh, God who not only not only does, you know, as I think about our Declaration of Independence, it declares liberty. Uh, our Constitution and the Bill of Rights they uh, affirm and they guarantee or they, uh, they protect liberty. But it is really only the presence of God which can truly give liberty. Everything else is, as we talked about before and as some of the quotes iterated, is just really a, another form of slavery. Another form of slavery. This is not a perspective to drag down our gratitude for the privilege that we enjoy as uh, you know, citizens of this nation. But merely to condition and help us understand that many of our countrymen do not, they don't grasp that. That they think that it is as good as it gets just being able to enjoy the privilege of living in this country when there is a country that is beyond this. That they need to know, that they need to understand there is a God of liberty. Apostle Paul wrote, Galatians chapter 5 he says stand fast therefore in the liberty which Christ has made us free do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage and you know we've spent the last 16 months uh, I guess probably just to be completely transparent 
we've sacrificed a little bit of liberty and latitude in the restrictions that we've accommodated. Uh, I, I really don't have any regret for that. I do recognize it though. I, I think about that. I think about uh, how chafing it was and uh, how restrictive it felt. And uh, I think about what it means as a child of God to uh, enter into the true liberty that comes by knowing Jesus Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul was warning of here. He says, don't entangle yourself and take upon yourself the restrictions of laboring in a world that does not understand true liberty. The liberty that you've been given and guaranteed in Christ. And I want to place before you today, if you're sitting here today, I want you to understand that, you know, this was just a short amount of time and restrictions that were, you know, they were bearable. But we live in a place where there are many of the people who are around us here who have never experienced what it means to have liberty in Christ. And if we're not careful, we can live like, we can live our life like that liberty is not something that needs to be put on the forefront uh, of who we are and what we do. We can enjoy the privilege of this nation we can buy things, we can work, we can enjoy our houses. None of those things in themselves are inherently wrong. But if you're here this morning, and especially if you're part of this church, I want to call you to understand that there are people around us, people who don't understand what it means to be liberated from things like the guilt of sin don't understand what it means to have liberty from the fear of death they, they don't understand that and it's our task as people who know God and understand it to reach those who don't have that the Apostle Paul had that desire that his countrymen might know who Jesus Christ was my desire is that will you pray with me that God will create a revival in the hearts of his people in this nation and that we might rise up with the seriousness uh, about sharing Christ with those around us. Will you be a part of that with me? I'd ask that you bow your head and just join me in praying about that now. Father, I want to thank you so much for who you are. Uh, you open our eyes to uh, the things that hold an inherent untruth in this world we live in. Um, you condition us in the liberty you give us with an understanding of limits, limits that are tempered with love. And Father, you remain the only Lord of true liberty, the Lord who loves without measure, the Lord who saves um, Father, without end. And I'd ask, Father, that you would push into our hearts uh, as a church, Father, that you would give us a renewed love for the people who are around us who do not know you through your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that we would rise up and that we would speak the gospel, which is the only answer for true liberty. Father, give us boldness, give us courage, give us single-mindedness in this task. Father, I lay these things before you, and I pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to close in uh, just a, a, couple of, a couple of things to leave you with before we get on with uh, our celebration of uh, independence, the proclamation of freedom, which is so important to us as a country, and uh, the opportunity to enjoy our liberty this morning in an overcast sky and 60 degree weather in North Carolina. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, as we contemplate that, uh, the thought that, that I have really is that uh, in Christ, we, we truly can celebrate our independence. And we truly can proclaim our freedom. And we can enjoy our liberty in a way that people who don't know Him can't. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of things, eating some food 
Yeah, if you weigh if you weigh uh, over a hundred and a hundred pounds or so, you can't get in our jump house. All right, so <laughs> they'll be doing that. But there'll be people out there. With so the kids rude. Out there. Okay. So, I, I almost said if you weigh less than me, but that would have allowed way too many people. To go to uh, but I, I'm going to be around, and uh, I'll probably have some food in my hand and eating the same as everybody else. But I would love to have a conversation with you about what it means to know this Lord of Liberty, which we serve. So uh, please, uh, please don't hesitate to talk with me about it if I can answer questions or share with you who Jesus is in my life. Uh, so, hey, we're going to stop now. Brad, uh, you got announcements to make and uh, yep. uh, food to bless, I guess. Sure thing. All right. Thanks, guys, for being here today. And we hope you guys will all stay to eat with us. If you guys just give us a minute, and we, what we'll do is we're going to kind of clear this a little bit. Be careful when you walk up here. We're going to enter this door right here, and uh, they will serve you your food, and then you'll exit. There's drinks and stuff over here to grab, and then you exit. And then what, what, what you can do is there's table set up. You can take the chairs, move stuff around wherever you want. Sit at a table, sit at a chair, stand, sit on the ground. I don't care what you do. You can have at it. And then you're free. Um, you're free. Yeah. <laughs> Where you go? Where? How appropriate. <laughs> and then, um, and just a reminder, we're going to be meeting for the next uh, two months, uh, July and August. We'll be meeting at 10 o'clock inside the building most weeks. So um, other than that, I think uh, I think we're good to go. So let's pray for our food. And then, like I said, just hold on for just a minute. You guys can mingle until we tell you to come forward. All right, Father God in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for our gathering here today. God, to thank you for the people. And we thank you uh, today for our country that you have blessed us with. And we pray, pray your blessing upon the USA. God, we thank you for Jesus, most importantly, because he is our freedom from guilt, and shame, and death. That is what we stand for today. God, we love you so much. And we just uh, thank you for allowing us together today. We thank you for the food that we have and we ask your blessing upon it. And the a blessing upon our fellowship today and as we celebrate uh, our country for the remainder of the day. Lord, we love you and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.